Hi, and welcome to Coffee Kids and Orthopedics On Demand. I'm David Podeswa. I'm the clinical director of our limb lengthening and reconstruction service here at Scottish Rite Hospital. Today, we're going to be talking about limb length differences A to Z, uh, assessing and managing limb length differences in the growing child. I have no relevant disclosures uh, for this talk, uh, and just we're going to take just a minute and go through the objectives of this talk. And uh, the first objective is we're going to discuss the common etiologies of limb length differences in children's and children and adolescents. We're, after this talk, you should be able to describe the ideal technique for clinically assessing a limb length difference. You should be able to compare and contrast the options for treating a child or adolescent with a limb length difference. And should be able to identify the indications for non-operative and operative treatment of a limb length difference. Today, in talking about assessing and managing limb length difference, we're going to review the etiology of common limb length differences, history and physical exam, the radiographic assessment, predicting a limb length difference, different treatment options, and the timing uh, of intervention for these uh, differences. First, we want to start a little bit general, and really, does a limb length difference make a difference in the long term? Uh, function of a child and an adult. And we know that the asymptomatic leg length differences of less than two centimeters is relatively common. And I tell families all the time that there are millions of people in the world walking around with a two centimeter or two and a half centimeter, which is an inch, right? So an inch or less difference, and they don't know it, and it doesn't have any ill effect on them over the course of time. And this has been shown uh, to be very common throughout different populations. Whether this has a long-term impact uh, really is still unclear and somewhat controversial when you're asking, does a limb length difference have a, make a difference on low back pain uh, or degenerative joint disease? We know that uh, from our own studies, and we're going to review this a little bit later into the talk, that in inst with instrumented gait analysis studies, they generally show that there's no significant functional uh, disturbance uh, when you have a leg length difference that's less than 3% of the, of the contralateral long side. So if it's less than two and a half centimeters or less than an inch, it doesn't really have any gait disturbance uh, and generally won't have any functional disturbance. So really what we're, our goal uh, at any time is that at the time of skeletal maturity, if we have a limb length difference that's less than an inch or ideally less than two centimeters, then we feel very comfortable telling the patient and the family that this isn't anything to worry about and that this will not have any ill effect on the ankles, knees, hips, back along the way. And that usually is very helpful for the family to know that that's the goal and to have a little bit of difference. So when you see a patient in clinic, uh, particularly the skeletally mature patient that might have just a subtle limb length difference. If they don't have any other underlying problems and that's all they have, then it's easy to reassure them that that's not a problem. General principles of evaluating the patient uh, is important, uh, particularly when the patient uh, is younger. So we want to give a really broad overview of the patient, and you can do that relatively quickly, and that's going to give you some idea of pointing to an etiology of a, of a limb length difference. So obviously when you're evaluating a small child, and these are things you're gonna do naturally anyways, but when you're evaluating the small child, we're gonna check height, weight, head circumference. We're gonna screen for abnormal facies. We're gonna look at their back to see if there's any uh, hairy patches, any, any dimpling that we might think of spinal dysraphism, torticollis, digital anomalies, foot deformities, uh, and then also with limb length differences, is there a difference at that time? And if there's a difference and then we see some of these other things, then that's going to point us to more of a congenital uh, etiology. We want to do a good hip exam. Uh, limb length differences can be associated with hip problems. A hip problem in itself can look like a limb length difference, and that's important to pick up, and we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Evaluate the small children while they're walking, playing, and uh, just behaving in the room, uh, and something that you typically already do, but we look at it very much from a musculoskeletal, from a function standpoint. Are they, are they limping? Are they able to sit, stand, walk, crawl? Will they run away from you? They'll typically run away from me. They won't run to me. They'll definitely run away from me. Uh, and we want to be able to see their legs and their upper, upper extremities. If they come in in sweatpants, everyone, everyone is placed into shorts. Take their shoes and socks off. Look at their feet. It's a very good, uh, the, the feet can be a really good indication of something else going on and, and have some very subtle findings. 
So the box on the right hand side of your screen uh, is just a quick rule out examination. It's a very easy, quick orthopedic examination. And a lot of times can rule in or rule out whether what you're looking at orthopedically is related to something neurologic or something related to a congenital issue or a developmental issue, or is the patient really just normal uh, and there really isn't anything underlying. But all of this can be done very quickly just within a minute of having them walk, hop up and down, hop on one foot. And it's as simple as hopping on one foot, whether they can do that symmetrically is important and whether they can do it at all is important. And it sounds e easy, but it actually requires a fair amount of strength and coordination. Heel walk, toe walk, walking on the lateral border of their foot, squatting down, standing up, sitting on the floor and standing up without the use of their hands and having them do that quickly. All these things, it's very easy to do, very quick. And within a minute or two, you've got a pretty good idea of whether their coordination and their function is, is normal. And that helps, uh, again, guide where this etiology uh, of limb link difference may be coming from. And again, when we talk about the etiologies, there's broad categories that we look at. Uh, congenital limb deficiencies, neuromuscular disorders, post-traumatic, growth disturbances, and hemiatrophy uh, syndromes. And we're going to talk just a little bit about each one of those uh, right now. When we look at congenital uh, deficiencies, we're going to talk about a couple of them right now. Um, posteromedial bowing. So this is a bowing of the leg and particularly of the tibia. So the posteromedial bow, meaning the tibia will be bowed posteriorly into the medial side. This is most commonly associated with a calcaneovalgus foot at birth, meaning that the foot, the dorsum of the foot, is you know plastered up against the anterior tibia uh, when they're born. And it's a very alarming uh, uh, condition it can be very alarming for the parents when they have this foot um, deformity when the child is born. It can also be associated sometimes with some knee issues like hyperextension of the knee as well. Um, but typically, the foot deformity uh, is obviously what's seen at birth. Now, the very uh, the good thing about what we call this calcaneovalgus foot deformity uh, is that it responds very well to simple stretching. Very occasionally, it might need to be casted, but it responds well to stretching. The patient is left with a bow in their leg, but most commonly this type of bow will straighten up with growth. Now it may not completely straighten up with growth and it's not going to take, and it's not going to do it quickly. You know, we, it's not going to be on the scale of months and years. It's not going to be a few weeks. And even at the, you know, first birthday, they're still going to have a bow in their leg. Most of the time, and it's, I would say the vast majority of time, this doesn't have any effect on their function. They're going to be running. They're going to learn to crawl. They're going to learn to walk. They're going to start running and jumping and playing, even with a little deformity in their tibia. And it's not going to necessarily have any ill effect on their foot or ankle, but it will take time. And most of that bow will go away. However, the long-term effect of this condition is that they're usually left with a leg length difference at the time that they're done growing. And the most common, as it says here, is two to six centimeters, but generally three to five is by far the most common uh, amount of discrepancy that they will have at the time that they're done growing. Uh, and this is important just to follow along. That amount of discrepancy uh, doesn't really require any treatment until they're closer to being done growing when that can usually be dealt with with what we call an epiphysiodesis or slowing the growth of the long leg so that the short leg can grow and catch up. Very rarely, if it's more five or six centimeters, we'll do a lengthening and we'll talk about that uh, later in this talk as well. The key here, though, is the foot deformity will get better with some stretching and manipulation. They'll be left with a leg length difference uh, when they're done growing. When we talk about anterolateral bowing, almost the opposite of the posteromedial. Again, we have a bow in the tibia, a bow in the leg bone, where it's going to come out um, both to the front and to the outside. Uh, this uh, is a much more concerning uh, deformity and, and leg length difference uh, because this bow is associated with changes in the bone, uh, much as you see in the image on the right hand side of the screen. With bowing, uh, you can see cystic changes within the bone. Uh, and in this uh, image, you can see that there is an actual pseudarthrosis. So there's a false joint. This child was born with what was believed to be, you know, what is believed to be a fracture in the tibia, which isn't truly a fracture. It's that the bone is not healed. Uh, and this is a false joint or a congenital pseudarthrosis. Now, 50% of these patients uh, will have associated uh, neurofibromatosis. 
And if the neurofibromatosis isn't diagnosed before we see them, uh, it's something that everyone gets sent for evaluation for because this is obviously very important to pick up the neurofibromatosis uh, component. Congenital fibular deficiency is another of the congenital uh, etiologies. This is far and away uh, the most common of the long bone deficiencies. Um, it's characterized obviously by a partial or complete absence of the fibula with associated anomalies. So fibular deficiency falls into a spectrum uh, and it really falls into a spectrum of uh, associated anomalies from the hip down. Uh, and this, this can include uh, hip dysplasia, it can, it can include uh, femoral shortening as, a well, as well as uh, tibial and fibular shortening. Uh, it can, will typically uh, be associated with additional knock knee on that side. So genuvalgum is commonly associated with this because they will get a hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle. So they will naturally uh, drift into uh, knock knee. They'll have foot and ankle uh, anomalies uh, and because of uh, associated uh, foot uh, deformity, such as a tarsal coalition in the foot, primarily in the hind foot, uh, will cause uh, ankle abnormalities and a ball and socket ankle joint. And then if they're going to, to they will uh, frequently be missing the lateral raise of their foot. Uh, but there's a huge spectrum of fibular deficiency from very, very subtle changes where you is only uh, identifiable on a radiograph measuring the lengths of the fibulas to complete absence and having, uh, you know, one or two ray foot and significant deformity. So there's a huge spectrum uh, of this condition. When we talk about neuromuscular disorders, uh, the most common that we see is demonstrated by the image on the right hand side. That is a what we consider to be a high arched foot with a varus hind foot. So the foot is rolling, looks like the ankle is rolling out, the heel is in. There's this uh, cavo varus foot deformity, uh, and this is very typical of an underlying neurologic condition. Uh, we always worry about when we see it uh, in a unilateral, uh, uh, unilaterally, we worry about something coming from the spinal cord. Is there a spinal tethering? Uh, if we see it bilaterally, uh, then we think of more of uh, the Charcot-Marie tooth, the hereditary motor sensory uh, conditions, uh, particularly if we're starting to, if you ask and you say, you know, the family starts to tell you that, yeah, oh yeah, you know, we have a lot of people in the family that have high arches or, and many will tell you that they have already been diagnosed with uh, Charcot-Marie tooth disease. But this needs to be uh, sort of high, high index of suspicion uh, for a condition like this. And this again will give you uh, leg length differences. Post-traumatic uh, leg length differences is usually pretty easy to identify up front because there is a traumatic event that is usually easily uh, identified uh, and is typically already being followed uh, by uh, some physician who's treating the, treating the fracture. Uh, but there are times where we definitely see kids who had an innocuous injury uh, and didn't receive treatment and then come and when we obtain an x-ray we find that they've had an injury to the growth plate along the way. Uh, and these, uh, there are definitely different techniques for addressing the physeal disturbance uh, in addition to addressing the leg length difference. There are other physeal growth disturbances, infection, uh, common, um, you know, we commonly see leg length differences in the, uh, in the very small child that may have had an infection after spending time in the intensive care unit uh, as an infant, uh, and chondromas, osteochondromas, unicameral bone cysts, post-radiation, um, if they've been treated for a malignancy along the way, Blount's disease, Perthes disease, all these things affect the growth of the physes and a growth of the lower extremity and therefore will induce a leg length difference. Hemiatrophy syndromes, uh, the, the uh, young lady that you see in the right-hand uh, picture is has Russell Silver syndrome, so uh, they are of a small stature, but they will also have uh, hemiatrophy. So one side will be shorter than the other and smaller than the other. The TEV, I suppose I should have written that out, that's 
a Telopes equinovaris or a club foot, which a club foot is really just an abnormal development, basically from the knee down. So not only will the foot be deformed, the foot will be small, but you'll have uh, atrophy of the calf muscles and the leg itself will also be a little bit smaller and therefore induce a limb link difference. Uh, so these type of uh, etiologies are fairly easy to pick out because they're going to be identified before they uh, present uh, with a leg link difference. But knowing that these conditions can have an associated leg link difference, it's important then to talk with the family about that, warn them, or at least be able to easily explain why that's, why that's happening. Just to touch on again, the apparent leg length difference. And this goes back again to a really good physical exam in the small child. This is a, the picture on the right, the x-ray of the lower extremities. If you look closely, you'll notice that there's a dislocated hip on the uh, right side. This is a 17-month-old uh, child who came walking into clinic and the family was concerned because it was walking up on their right toe a little bit and they felt to have a leg length difference. And yes, they do have a leg length difference, but it's an apparent leg length difference. It's not a true leg length difference because there's actually no difference in the length of the femurs or the tibias, but with the hip dislocated, it gives that appearance of the limb length difference. The key here is the physical exam. There's gonna be asymmetry, not necessarily in the uh, internal or external range of motion, but if you try to abduct the hip, there's going to be asymmetry in uh, the abduction. So anyone that comes in limping under the age of five, this is gonna be a really, Again, the hip exam is a really important part of the uh, physical exam. When we talk about the etiology of leg length difference and the legs being one leg being longer, so sometimes you have to look at the leg length difference to say, okay, is the short leg the abnormal leg or is the short leg the normal leg? And it's the long leg that's truly abnormal. So there are definitely um, cases where we see that. You can have a post-traumatic overgrowth syndrome. We know that in the young child, when they break their femur, you know, someone who's two, three, four years of old, years of age, you know, that break their femur, when it heals, it's very common that they have an overgrowth of the femur by up to an inch. So we see that in certain injuries, that lower extremity or that segment of the leg will respond uh, to the fracture with a healing response that will cause the leg to actually grow a little bit longer. We know that there are soft tissue overgrowth syndromes. We see this in neurofibromatosis with Klippel Trenaway syndrome, Beckwith Wiedemann, Proteus, and what we call idiopathic hemihypertrophy. These are kids that will present with uh, legs that are longer than the normal side. Many of these will also have these soft tissue overgrowth syndromes will have uh, muscle or uh, soft tissue girth that's bigger than the normal side. So that's actually a pretty, that makes it a little bit easier. When you measure the circumference of the thigh, you measure the circumference of the calf, and you match that to the other side, and you realize that the one side is bigger, then you realize that that's out of proportion, and then it's gonna be an overgrowth syndrome. These are important to recognize because they will all have other associated things that will need to be dealt with. The most common that we see is the idiopathic hemihypertrophy. These are kids that will present either with isolated leg, uh, thigh and leg, or even have an entire side of the body a little bit bigger than the other side that can affect the upper extremity and even the face. The idiopathic hemihypertrophy, the key there is that that can be associated with Wilms tumor. Uh, so uh, institutionally, we recommend uh, abdominal ultrasounds from the age of zero until seven or eight years of age, abdominal ultrasounds twice a year uh, to help uh, evaluate and rule out uh, a Wilms tumor along the way. It doesn't happen very often, but we do have cases of identifying the Wilms tumor, so the key is regular uh, ultrasounds of the abdomen. And again, inflammatory arthritis adds to that list of things that can cause the leg to grow a little bit longer. Things that you may see uh, in your physical exam with the child as when we talk about gait strategies to compensate for limb length difference. And the family may not complain of the limb length difference and may not notice a limb length difference, but if you notice these type of things with a child uh, or an adolescent walking or running, uh, then it should strike a little, uh, you know, raise your index of suspicion just a little bit. So kids will often circumduct the long leg, you know, so they'll swing the leg out uh, to overcome the leg length difference of the long leg. 
They may walk with the long leg, uh, in the particular, the knee, walk with the knee bent. So they will uh, walk with the short leg flat on the floor and bend the long leg. They may vault over the long leg instead of swinging it out to keep their pelvis level. They may kind of step up and over the long leg and as we go vaulting over that, so they'll have a very uh, distinct gait. Or they're going to walk on their toe on the short side, which is probably the most common. But to be honest with you, in the patients that we see, it's usually sort of a 50-50 split on those who like to walk on their toe and live life a little bit taller or those who will walk flat and bend the, uh, the knee of the long leg and just live life a little bit shorter. Uh, it just comes down to the, the sort of how the child uh, wants, to, wants to do that. And these, again, these strategies are usually not seen for differences less than five, five and a half percent of the length of the long leg, again, which is about four centimeters. So uh, this is a chart taken from a study done at this institution uh, back in the late 90s. And what this chart uh, shows is it shows 35 patients with varying limb length differences and increasing limb length differences as we go from uh, left to right. The percent of the long limb uh, is uh, the so is the uh, y-axis. It's not the uh, actual uh, length limb length difference, but it's the percentage difference. So if we put that red line at about five percent of a relative to the long side, you can see that those in the green are those who are walking up on their toes, and it's really once we get to that four centimeter or about five percent and we say four centimeters because the average adult has an 80 centimeter uh, lower extremity length and give or take a couple centimeters you know one way or the other for males and females but just use 80 because math is easy with 80. So five percent difference from side to side from an 80 centimeter adult is four centimeters. So that's an easy number to remember that really anything under four centimeters isn't gonna significantly affect gait. Uh, and it's over that four centimeter difference where kids are gonna to tend to walk up on their toes or adolescents, adults, et cetera. Uh, so that's just an easy number to, to remember. We're gonna jump now to the clinical assessment of a limb length difference. And this is really if there's going to be one thing we want to take home from this talk, um, this is really the important one because uh, it's very easy to fool yourself in or out of the diagnosis of a limb length difference. So the, most commonly, people will lay the patient supine and try to measure the limb length differences from, and if you look at A on the right-hand side of the screen, that's measuring from the umbilicus to the medial malleoli on each, uh, each side. And that is a way of determining the uh, limb length difference. However, it's very easy to move the leg and move the pelvis and get fooled by that measurement. So measuring from the umbilicus and measuring from the anterior superior iliac spine are common measures. So in B, uh, the middle image on the right side, measuring from the umbilicus, uh, gives the appearance of a leg length difference when there really isn't one, because you can see on that image, the pelvis is oblique. And by just moving the pelvis obliquely, obliquely, you can make, in this case, the left side seem longer than the right, where it may measure differently, but ultimately it's not any different if you level the pelvis, and that's really important on how you position the legs. And C is the same thing, say, using the anterior superior iliac spine uh, to measure. You can see that even with the obliquity of the pelvis, that measures, uh, you will then get equal measurements. So you have to be very careful. This is a method that we don't recommend. Um, it's again, prone to error, often not reproducible, because you can measure them one day, and if they're relying just a little bit different, it's going to look different, whether it's one hour later or one day later. Uh, so our preferred method is to have the patient standing. Uh, we want to level the pelvis and we use graduated blocks. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, blocks lying around every clinic all over the place. If you don't have blocks, you can use books, you can use whatever it takes to, for the patient to stand on and level that pelvis and then measure what they're standing on to identify what that leg length difference is. So very simple clinical exam with them standing uh, and we 
will stand uh, with the patient facing away from you. So you're standing behind them. You're putting your fingers on their iliac uh, on the top of their iliac crest, which can be difficult to do in some larger, fluffier patients. It is admittedly a little bit hard to do, uh, but again, it's going to be the most accurate way of identifying that discrepancy. So this is just an example of me standing behind this patient. Um, there, I can see their lower extremities. We are making sure that they're standing with their foot flat on the block and their knees fully extended. And I've got my hands on top of the iliac crest. And this is just another view. And again, you can see, and you'll have to believe me on this one, that my fingers are at the same level on the iliac crest. So the iliac crest is nice and balanced with this two and a half centimeter block underneath this patient's foot. Now, there are, there are difficulties uh, if there are associated conditions uh, with these patients. Uh, joint contractures are difficult uh, because they can give the appearance of a leg length difference that may or may not be there. So these images are the uh, a picture of a child who has hemiparesis on the right side. So this patient standing looks like they have a significant leg length difference on the right side. You know, the, they're standing on their toe, the heel is off the ground, the left foot is flat on the ground, and you can see the knee is obviously higher on the right side than on the left. But this is not a true uh, leg length difference. With this type of patient, you have to be very diligent about looking for contractures of the joints. So hip flexion contractures, um, whether, or I should say hip contractures, whether they be hip flexion contractures, or in this case, an adduction, an adduction contracture, if the hip is adducted, then for them to get their foot underneath them, they're going to swing their foot underneath them and they're gonna end up with a very oblique pelvis. That foot, that leg is going to come, toe is going to come up off the ground so that they can get it underneath them and it's going to give them that appearance of a leg length difference. Hip flexion contractures, knee flexion contractures can all give the appearance of a discrepancy when there really isn't one. Uh, Aquinas contractures, so you know, contractures at the ankle um, also can give that appearance. So because of that, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to measure, particularly if you're using a supine um, measurement. Uh, but again, physical exam is really key to addressing these issues that can affect the, affect the diagnosis. Uh, again, similarly, pelvic obliquity. Um, when we talk about pelvic obliquity, we're talking about uh, conditions that can affect the lumbar spine. Uh, and then again, deformity of the pelvis itself for any number of reasons. And these are the type of things that will then be easy to identify on radiographs as well. Scoliosis. Scoliosis is one that will, uh, it is not uncommon that we will have a patient referred in for a leg length difference when really they have scoliosis and vice versa, where we'll, they'll fail a screening thinking that they have scoliosis when really they don't and it's a leg length difference. And this is where the physical exam part really is important. Again, uh, and having the patient stand and equalize the leg length. Because a lumbar scoliosis, like you see in this image on the right, you can see that this will give you pelvic obliquity. So if you're standing and having that patient stand and you have their fingers on their iliac crest, then that uh, they're going to have one that's going to be higher than the other. And that may make you think, okay, they have a leg length difference. Now, if you then level the pelvis, you put a little block or a book underneath their foot and level that pelvis, if, that's, if, if the scoliosis is related to a leg length difference, that scoliosis is going to go away when you level the pelvis. But if you level that pelvis and you do your forward bend test again and they still have the scoliosis, then it's the scoliosis that's driving the pelvic obliquity and making it look like they have a leg length difference. Um, so it's very, so it's important to, to try to decipher between those or as it says, you can have them sit down. Uh, and if it's the leg length difference driving the scoliosis, when you sit and you look at their back, the scoliosis will go away. Uh, so very important to identify uh, each of those, uh, each of those conditions. So now that we've diagnosed the leg length difference, what do we do radiographically uh, to help, you know, one to look at uh, any associated anomalies or just to be able to measure that leg length difference as well and what x-rays should you get? Well, first of all, I would say, one, you don't have to get x-rays. If you're concerned enough about the leg length difference, 
let you know we're happy to take care of that and happy to uh, get radiographs on our own. But if you're going to send someone for a radiograph, particularly if you really don't think they have a leg link difference and you want to appease mom or dad or grandma that there isn't a problem with their leg link difference, then the ideal image is to get a standing AP of the both lower extremities. Um, and if you think that there's a subtle difference, you want to have them stand on that same block or book that leveled their pelvis in the clinic room so that when they're taking the x-ray, they're standing with their pelvis nice and level. Uh, the important thing, again, correct the discrepancy because when you have this standing film, you not only can see the leg length difference, uh, but the standing film will also give you an idea if there's any associated angular deformity uh, at the knee or ankle. Uh, and that's important. that's important for us uh, when we start talking about the potential need for treating these. Just to touch on the different radiographic techniques, the AP of the lower extremity standing is the important one. There are other ways that uh, different uh, radiology uh, tech, uh, techs will do this. Um, teloretinography uh, is the simplest, uh, but it's also the most uh, subject to magnification error where the patient is lying down and they take one image uh, centered at the knee. So you get parallax at the hip and the ankle and you don't have a very good appreciation for uh, the joint deformity uh, and you can't measure the actual lengths of the leg off that uh, image. Orthoretinography is another technique where they use uh, three images and then, then stitch them together Again, that's three exposures, that's a lot of radiation. Less magnification error, uh, and when done with a ruler, you can measure the leg, uh, but it's a lot of radiation. And you'll notice that these first two techniques and this third technique of, of doing a scanogram, these are the patients are supine, so you can't get an idea of what their lower extremity alignment is like when they're standing. Um, scanograms very commonly used, particularly in kids who have joint deformity uh, that can't stand with their legs straight. Um, then this is a technique where you take a picture at the hip, the knees, and the ankles with a ruler in place, and you can measure the distances between them, and you can get an idea of what the femur length and the tibial lengths are. However, you can't see, again, associated deformity associated with those bones. Uh, so that's a definite uh, drawback. Uh, though we still use this technique, we don't use it nearly as much as we uh, used to. Um, CT, scanograms, ultrasound, there are roles in very select cases. But again, for the addition, for the evaluation or assessment of a limb length difference, um, these are not going to be used routinely. This is, these are for very select uh, uh, cases. This the use of EOS, um, and the image on the right actually is the EOS machine. Um, this has been sort of, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but has definitely changed our practice uh, for the better for multiple reasons. This is a radiographic technique uh, that uses microdose radiation exposure compared to a standard radiograph, so it's much safer for the child, but we get a lot more information with a lot less radiation. We get simultaneous frontal and lateral imaging without magnification. So the patient can either sit or stand, and over the course of a few seconds, the image is obtained. Basically, well, we use this for scoliosis and for lower extremity, but in this case for lower extremity, they start at the top of the pelvis and that the machine scans the lower extremities uh, and gives you a non-magnified view of the lower extremities. So we're, we can get actual length measurements from this and not have to worry about having a ruler in place. The only drawback to the EOS is the patient has to be old enough and has to be able to stand still for those few seconds while that image is being done. Because if there's any motion, then it affects uh, the look of the lower extremity. And it can give you the idea that there is a deformity of the lower extremities that really isn't there. The uh, upside too is that in select cases, we, there can be post-production uh, 3D uh, imaging that can be created from the two views that we get. Uh, and we don't get two views on everyone. When we're doing the AP of the lower extremities, really we're just getting the, the standing, um, just the frontal view uh, most of the time. 
Uh, so there's a lot that we can do with this, and EOS has really made it safer for our for our kids uh, and has given us more information to be more accurate what we're doing. So this has been a big step forward for us, both on our main campus and on our, our Frisco campus. We're very lucky to be able to have one on each uh, each campus. So how do we predict what the limb length discrepancy is going to be now that we've identified it, now we've taken a picture of it? Next question is, so what? Well, that's the next question. So predicting what the discrepancy at skeletal maturity is going to be is really the most important thing that we do because that's what families want to know is, okay, Tommy or Susie is, you know, five and has a one centimeter leg length difference. Is that one centimeter leg length difference going to stay one centimeters until they're done growing? Or is that going to get worse? And if it is going to get worse, what is it going to be? Because depending on what it's going to be at scale maturity will depend on, well, that will have a significant effect on what we recommend during that time period from the time that they're five to the time that they're done growing. So there are different ways of doing this. And I'm not going to get into the weeds too much on these different different uh, ways of predicting it uh, because some of these are historical, uh, but it just gives you a perspective of, of how we do this. The, and this, this lists all of the ways we do it, and we're going to touch on each one of them uh, for just a, just a second. The white menelos formula, this is actually pretty important because it helps in the dis uh, describing parents' sort of growth of the lower extremity. So Basically, what the white mental loss formula tells us is how much growth per year we get at each growth plate. So you can see that uh, the distal femur and the proximal tibia together, this nine millimeters and six millimeters, that accounts for 1.5 centimeters of growth per year on average. Now, no child grows 1.5 centimeters from their distal femur and proximal tibia every year until they're done growing, right? There's there's some variation in how much they grow. But if you look at it over time, on average, that's what it is. And that accounts for 65% of the growth of the lower limb. So we know that the proximal femur grows about two millimeters a year, the distal femur about nine millimeters, proximal tibia about six, and the distal tibia about four. So knowing those, those are uh, excellent numbers to use when we're trying to calculate the impact of a physeal arrest if there's been a trauma and that growth plate is injured, then we know and stopped growing, then we know about how much discrepancy over the next few years is going to happen. Uh, and when we talk about doing an epiphysiodesis, this is actually, this formula is what's now been proven by some work at our own institution, is probably the best way to calculate when to do an epiphysiodesis, meaning when to slow down the long side so that the short side can grow and catch up. Um, and this is all based on, again, the growth, what we think is the, what we know to be the growth at each of those physes. And knowing that grow, girls grow to 14 and boys grow to 16, we can then do those calculations fairly easily. The Green, An Green Anderson growth remaining charts are charts that you may have seen um, all along the way. We don't really use them as much as we used to because we now have these other techniques that have proven to be better. Um, the downside of this growth remaining uh, is that a lot of data and a lot of people use these, uh, but these were only created out of 67 boys and 67 girls from the 1950s, and I think then they were all white. So we're, we're talking about a very select population of kids that does not necessarily represent today's children or certainly across a spectrum of different, uh, you know, races uh, and uh, cultures. The Mosley straight, straight line graph is actually the most accurate method of predicting what limb length discrepancy is going to be. Uh, but it also uh, is one of the most difficult to use because you have to have multiple time points. So you need at least three scanograms, or in our case, EOS measurements. So you need three measurements of the lengths of the lower extremities separated by at least six months um, with associated bone age, meaning getting a hand uh, or and or an elbow uh, to help identify what the bone age is so you can then predict what the discrepancy is going to be. And you can use this graph to help uh, predict or identify when is the best time to intervene with an epiphysiodesis. So we still use this from a, uh, we don't use this as much clinically as we use for research purposes uh, because we have uh, other techniques. And finally, the multiplier method, when used for predicting limb length differences, is actually the simplest and is 
proved to be just as good as any other technique. And this is, this is the advent of technology, right? So what you're looking at on the right is a screenshot of an app uh, that has been developed based on uh, the work of Dror Paley, creating uh, different multipliers to be able to predict uh, not only uh, well limb lengths and therefore limb length differences uh, at different ages and and at skeletal maturity. So you can plug into uh, a little app what the what bone segment you're looking at, whether it's the femur, the tibia, or in this case the entire leg, male or female. You type in their age what discrepancy you have at that age, and it's gonna tell you then what the discrepancy is going to be when they're done growing. And this is fairly accurate for the prediction of limb length difference. It's not particularly good for uh, predicting when to do an epiphysis, but it's very good at predicting what the overall length difference is going to be. And if families ask you, um, well, so just to be clear, what this says is that the easiest lower limb multiplier to remember is two times at the age of four for boys and three for girls. So that's that's for limb length. That's not for overall height, just to be clear. The overall height is two times, um, and for girls, it's just under the age of two, and for boys, it's just over the age of two. You multiply their height by two, and that's, that's roughly their pretty good guesstimate of what their overall height is gonna be. This is another important point when you're talking to a family uh, or about uh, a congenital deficiency or congenital limb length difference, because the this adage, which makes you think that it's some sort of you know urban myth or you know some this is a, some sort of statement that doesn't necessarily stand the test of time. Well, this really has stood the test of time. The percent of lower extremity or limb length difference remains constant throughout growth. So a child who has a congenital femoral deficiency, who has a fibular deficiency or a tibial deficiency, that limb length difference, what you see when they're born from a percentage standpoint will remain constant through until they are done growing, uh, which again goes to um, uh, the math that I, we started to do earlier where if you look at the average lower extremity length of 80 centimeters, if I meet uh, a family for the first time when the child is, let's say, six months old, and we can measure the length of their legs, and we know that there's a 10% difference between their right leg and their left leg at six months of age, then I can predict that when they're done growing, they're still gonna have that same 10% difference between their legs. Now, the absolute value of that obviously is going to be much greater at skeletal maturity because their overall length of their leg is greater. So in this case, if for an average patient, and obviously not every patient is average, but you can gauge that based on the parents and, and the siblings, um, but if the average adult is 80 centimeters and at six months of age, they have a 10 centimeter difference, or 10% difference, then at skeletal maturity, they're going to have uh, an eight centimeter leg length difference. And in our own institution, this is held true in 85% of the patients that we looked at that had fibular deficiency, and that this was well over 100 patients. So that, that holds, pretty, holds true, pretty true. And it's a pretty good uh, starting point for a discussion for the family because what they see as not a very big discrepancy when they're really little um, can prove to be 20 centimeters when they're done growing. And that's a much different discussion when you can show them what 20 centimeters looks like and how that's gonna have an impact on a treatment, uh, treatment plan. And then when we talk about treatment and general principles, just so you have an idea of what we're thinking, um, and it's not always safe to know what we're thinking, but in this case, it's good to know what we're thinking. Um, when we talk about the management of limb length differences, again, less than two centimeters, we do not generally treat less than two centimeters because we know in the long term that's not gonna be a problem. Two to five centimeters, we're talking about a contralateral epiphysiodesis, again, slowing the growth of the long leg down and letting the short leg catch up. And generally for more than five centimeters, then we're looking at having to do a lengthening because to do an epiphysiodesis to slow the long leg down more than three or four centimeters then starts to affect overall height. And that's a lot to ask um, an epiphysiodesis to do as well. It doesn't always, isn't always as quite as accurate. 
limb lengthening, again, for the patients where we have a greater discrepancy of over five centimeters. Um, we break that, then start to break that down. If we're gonna do five to seven centimeters, that's usually one lengthening. We usually will only lengthen the bone about 15% of the long leg, and that's roughly, and it's generally about five centimeters, the femur being easier to lengthen than the tibia. Uh, so if we can get four or five centimeters, that's a good lengthening. If we have someone who has a seven to 10 centimeter discrepancy, then we're looking at having to do a lengthening plus an epiphysiodesis or two lengthenings. Sometimes the family does not want to do an epiphysiodesis. They feel very strongly about not touching the good leg, um, and that's understandable. Uh, again, 10 to 15 centimeters, you're looking at two lengthenings in epiphysiodesis. 15 to 20 centimeters or more, you're looking at three centimeters, uh, or excuse me, three lengthenings. And anytime we do a lengthening, you have to, you know, we tell the family up front, you need to commit six to 12 months to doing this. So it's a lot to ask under the best of circumstances. And when you get 20 centimeters, 15 to 20 centimeters, you then start to have to talk with the family about is attempt at lengthening and reconstructing that lower extremity. Um, going to be worth the time, the effort, the pain, and everything that's involved. And we do do we talk about potentially then doing an amputation in prosthetic wear. Uh, again, treatment modalities. We're just going to go through this uh, just quickly. Uh, again, a small discrepancy, no treatment. If the discrepancy is greater than two centimeters, and they have um, uh, a hemiparesis or some sort of paralysis, a stiff leg gait because of stiffness at the knee, um, or they're particularly weak at the hip, then we, we won't recommend treatment um, if it's over two centimeters and they have these type of things because if they have equal leg lengths and, a, and paralysis or a stiff leg or abductor weakness that can't be correct, the abductor weakness that can't be corrected with you know, therapy, then equal leg lengths will make it difficult for them to walk. They will have trouble clearing their foot. Uh, and therefore, having a shortening associated with certain conditions is actually a functionally better for them. Uh, kids who have, you know, two centimeters or two and a half centimeters, and, and we recommend not doing anything, but the family is very, you know, insistent on trying something. And, and if sometimes they need to do something to show that it really doesn't make a difference, then using an in-shoe lift is really the best place to start. Uh, a lift inside the shoe, usually you can only put about a centimeter lift inside a shoe before the shoe wear becomes, the shoe becomes too tight and it becomes difficult to wear. So you can make up half of a two centimeter difference inside the shoe. Uh, and most of the time, the kids and family, the kid will come back and say, I, I can't tell any difference and I don't care. And that's good because then that just reaffirms with the family that they don't care and it's not going to make, make a difference. An extension orthosis. Um, this is for limb length discrepancies that aren't easily managed by a shoe lift, usually um, if you have greater than five centimeters of a lift. So this is simply uh, a prosthetic that's created for the foot that is there and makes up the difference. So you basically have a foot on a foot. Um, and the, the tennis shoe here is the prosthetic foot, and above that is the foot of this patient in Aquinas, kind of sticking down into the prosthesis. Oftentimes, um, an AFO or a KAFO is attached. Um, there are many kids who use extension prostheses and then either go on to an amputation or use extension prostheses and go on to lengthening. And then there's lots of kids who use an extension prosthesis and they just love it and they don't really care about anything else and that's all they use. And as this last bullet point says, there's probably a whole bunch of kids that end up having treatment that probably would have done better just with an extension orthosis. But there's a cosmetic issue to it and some people don't like the idea of that. But that being said, it really works well and then when they have a good knee and a good hip, that they're very, very functional and don't have any problems with that. Epiphysiodesis, you've heard me use this term several times, and again, slowing the growth of the long leg and letting the short leg catch up. Um, classic indications are two to eight centimeters of discrepancy. I, I need to change that back to two to five centimeters, really. Again, eight would be too much. Um, there has to be adequate growth remaining. Um, so we usually say there has to be at least two years of growth remaining to make the epiphysiodesis worthwhile. Um, and that's where bone ages of the hand and elbow come in to help us identify whether there's two years of growth remaining. And some people say they should be of average height. Some people feel more strongly about taking their their predicted height into account. Most of the epiphysis 
prostheses we're doing um, usually will decrease the patient's height an inch or less. So their overall height an inch or less, maybe an inch and a half and rarely not two inches. So if you're talking about someone who's 5'6 going down to 5'5, five, five, that's usually probably not a big deal. Uh, but there are some kids who, who potentially are going from five foot to 4'11, which, you know, is a can be a functional difference. Um, and this is something just to take into account and talk, talk with the family about. Of course, when we're talking about epiphysiodesis or we're thinking about doing an epiphysiodesis, which bone, whether we're doing it in the femur or tibia, um, and uh, again, are there any conditions where equalizing the leg lengths would be a bad idea? And that's what we need to, to talk about with the family, in addition to the idea of operating on the good leg. Again, there are many families that feel strongly that they don't want to touch the non the, the, the good leg. Complications uh, happen. Um, inaccurate correction, meaning overcorrection or undercorrection, can happen. Uh, we think we've certainly gotten better at this over many, many years. Uh, again, using the white metal loss uh, technique helps us and the other techniques we have uh, to help predict this. Um, asymmetric closure happens in less than 5% of the patients, meaning that you go to slow the growth down in one side for whatever reason, despite your best effort, doesn't stop growing and can make the leg grow crooked. Uh, but that's something that we... Uh, uh, follow very closely and jump on, you know, and try to get a, before that creates a creates a problem. Um, it's the procedure of choice when applicable, and it is by far and away the most common procedure we do for limb length differences. Surgical shortening is another technique. This is one that used to be popular, and that uh, in the 15 years that uh, I've been practicing at this, 16 years now at this institution, we have not done ephemeral shortening. Um, it used to be very uh, popular with our lengthening techniques. This has gone gone away um, as much. Uh, particularly, we've also learned that if you lengthen or if you shorten too much, it affects the uh, the function of the muscles and can make it difficult to get the motor can, uh, the strength back and some of the coordination back when you shorten the muscles, uh, shorten the bone, and the muscles uh, aren't functioning at their normal length. Uh, so it's a technique we use, but one that uh, is not. Uh, commonly used anymore. And this is just an example of a shortening. The image on the left uh, shows uh, is a lateral of the femur and the bone that you see both in front and in back of the femur here is the segment that was shortened uh, using an intramedullary saw uh, to cut this out and have these done. So it's, you don't need to do this by a big open technique. You can do it through small incisions and then insertion of an intramedullary rod. Limb lengthening, and we could spend, and maybe at some point I will, spend an hour talking about limb lengthening because this is a very uh, big subject uh, in and of itself. Uh, but the indications for limb lengthening, um, the motivated patient, we say 8 to 18, and again, there's a lot of discussion and philosophical issues about uh, doing that, and I'll explain in just a minute. And greater than 4 centimeters of uh, shortening, um, at least 4 centimeters of shortening is helpful for us to do a uh, lengthening because it is a big deal. And if it's less than four centimeters, then an epiphysiodesis most commonly will, will work for us. Uh, there are many complications, potential complications associated with lengthening, so this isn't something that we take lightly. How do we do it? Well, we do it with either external fixation or we do it with an intramedullary rod, depending on uh, whether there's any associated deformity in the bone. Calistasis is a technique where basically, to make a long story short, we're fooling the body into thinking it's broken. You cut the bone, you let it start to heal just a little bit, and you slowly and gradually pull the bone apart. And we've identified that if you do it at about a millimeter a day or just under a millimeter a day, you can slowly pull that bone apart. The body thinks it's broken, it'll start to heal. You keep pulling it apart and it'll keep healing in behind it so that over time, uh, we this this heals. The use of an external fixation has some advantages in that there's nothing inside the bone or inside the body. No bone grafting is needed for uh, lengthening, uh, and it's very predictable from a healing standpoint uh, whether you use external fixation or an intramedullary rod. This is an example of intramedullary lengthening. This was an, a rod that was placed through the knee, so in a retro, what we call retrograde fashion. This was a, a teenager who had had Perthes disease, and you can see the hip deformity, uh, and had a four centimeter limb length difference. And you can see that over uh, four weeks, we had almost full. Uh, regained his full length that we were looking for. Uh, but then over at three months and uh, six months, you can see the uh, healing of the, of the bone. 
Um, considerations for limb lengthening. When we're talking about, again, talking about a pa talking to a patient about limb lengthening, uh, the important thing is to know what is the predicted, uh, you know, what is the predicted limb length difference at maturity, because that's going to again affect how many lengthenings they might need and other associated procedures. Um, the etiology. If we have to lengthen someone who has a congenital deficiency, that's much harder than lengthening someone who had uh, a growth disturbance after trauma or after, let's say, cancer or tumor. Um, when you're a congenital deficiency that is being lengthened 10 centimeters, that's a limb that never wanted to be 10 centimeters longer than it currently is. So when we are trying to lengthen a congenital uh, lower extremity, congenital deficiency, the soft tissues often want to fight back. It's a very easy to lengthen bone, and I tell this to every family. We can lengthen a bone almost infinitely, but you're lengthening muscles, tendons, nerves, uh, and all these things will oftentimes fight back, particularly if it never wanted to be longer than what it's pre-programmed to be in a, in a congenital deficiency. So all of these things are important to talk to the family because even though we have a goal of lengthening five centimeters, we may never get to five centimeters. We may lengthen two centimeters and they start to develop difficulties with the hip and knee that force us to stop. Uh, amputation is always an issue and amputation is part of lower extremity reconstruction. Uh, if the, again, if the discrepancy is 20% you know, or more, we're talking again, 15 or north of 20 centimeters um, and associated deformities, then an amputation is going to be in the best interest of that child uh, from a functional standpoint. All of our decisions are made, whether it's for lengthening, shortening, amputation, doesn't matter. All of the decisions we're making is what is going to be in the best interest from a functional standpoint for this child? How can we make them more functional with the least amount of surgery and allow them to keep their childhood as long as they can. And, and sometimes the, the best answer for that is an amputation so that they're up and running and doing everything with their peers instead of having multiple, multiple surgeries along the way. And these are important discussions that we have with the families every time we see them. So again, timing of lengthening, uh, just as we wrap this up, uh, epiphysiodesis, again, we try to do this near maturity so that we time their correction of the short leg catching up to the long leg. We time that so that they're about done growing when it happens. Uh, a single lengthening, we usually try to wait till after skeletal maturity uh, because the one, you know exactly how much you need to get. And second of all is the, is the uh, uh, emotional and psychological maturity of the patient is really critical, which we're going to talk about here. Double lengthenings, um, one will generally be before and one after skeletal maturity, depending on whether an epiphysiodesis is done. And then three lengthenings, uh, there's this rule of fours where oftentimes you do the first one, you know, you're looking at four, eight, 12, and 16, you know, for times of treatment. Um, and there's nothing about being, you know, you don't hold them to that, but it gives the family a good idea. If you can give them a plan of care when the child is six months of age, an idea of what they're looking at and when they're looking at it, it goes a long way for putting them at ease uh, that there's a plan. And, and even though it's going to take some time, the upside is that none of this has to be rushed into. How do we avoid complications? Well, avoiding limb lengthening avoids complications, and that's why we make a big deal about what we do. Uh, we make a big deal about it because complications can happen, and we make a big deal about this because this is a big stressor for the patient and the family. Again, limb lengthening is a 6 to 12 month commitment for any patient or family, and therefore we need to make sure that everyone is on the same page. We know from uh, studies here at this institution that during lower extremity reconstruction, whether it's lengthening or deformity correction, that <clears throat> there is a significant effect on the patient, whether it be mental status, loss of sleep, loss of appetite, academic problems. We preoperatively screen all patients and families being considered for any sort of limb lengthening. The more we learn about the patient, and this is exactly what I tell them, the more we learn about the patient, the more they learn about us, about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and more importantly, how to cope with it, then the better they're going to do. And we, we've proven that scientifically, that getting them ready beforehand makes a big difference while we're doing it, and it makes a big difference afterwards. And treating pain, sleep disorders, loss of appetite, we treat that very aggressively during, during uh, treatment. 
There are red flags that we've identified, single parent families, multiple surgeries, pre-existing psychiatric conditions, and young patients are also red flags for potential complications during lengthening. It's not a, uh, it's not a contraindication to lengthening, but these are the things that need to be addressed because there's a, it affects the family and the patient, uh, and these things uh, affect outcomes. These red flags are associated with all of these things, unplanned operations, unplanned readmissions, more narcotic use, longer inpatient stays, outpatient visits, longer time uh, either in their external fixator or before their weight bearing with intramedullary rods, increased need for antibiotics, poor outcomes. So again, it's incredibly important that we uh, identify these patients ahead of time and work with them ahead of time. So in general, the older the better, which is why we like to wait till they're closer to maturity, over 12 is ideal, just from their more physiologically and more psychologically mature. They can understand the process a little bit better and they need to participate in their recovery. Um, again, we, I say this to them all the time, this is something we have to do with them and not to them. You can do it to them when they're below five and that, that, that's just something that we have to deal with on certain occasions. But when it comes to lengthening when they're older, they have to be on the same page. They have to participate. Because if they don't participate in the rehab, then everything is going to go terribly wrong. Um, and it, lengthening, uh, you probably shouldn't even start it. Um, again, less than five, you're doing it to them. Uh, six to eight years of age, you're doing it with them. Uh, and it's six to eight psychologically, they're more likely to follow authority and follow the exercise program and work with their physician and their therapist. It's the nine to 12 year old that is the most developmentally difficult time because they start to be resistant and stubborn and, and can't follow directions. And if you have your own children at that age, you realize that, yes, I couldn't fathom doing a major surgery to them where for six months, they're going to be, you know, dealing with uh, a stressful uh, condition. Pre-existing, again, mental, pre-existing mental health conditions are really important to identify. So again, to wrap this up, with careful planning, patient selection, monitoring of lengthening, meticulous care of the soft tissues and judicious goals, good outcomes with preservation of function are achievable when we're talking about limb lengthening and reconstruction. Summary of uh, limb lengthening management, sort of what we talked about today is the importance of uh, a good history, the Good history and a careful physical exam gives you a really good idea of what the etiology of a limb length difference is and helps you to identify what the limb length difference is, where it's coming from. The radiographically, again, standing AP of the lower extremities is the ideal with a block. From the physical, again, from a physical exam standpoint, assessing them standing with something under their foot to level the pelvis is really important. Um, predicting their leg length and maturity has a trickle-down effect as to what we're gonna do and when we're gonna do it and what their treatment options are. And then we have to be very careful in how we plan those and how we execute those. And more importantly, how we prepare the family for all of those, which is a huge part of what we do and why we focus so much on the psychology side of things. Thank you very much for your time today. Do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions about anything we talked about today or any concerns uh, about a patient with a limb length difference. Thank you very much.